Creating a virtual machine, VMware training video 1-10. The objective of this video course is to explain what is a virtual machine composed of, then I will show you how to create a virtual machine, and then specify the settings of each individual virtual hardware component. Okay, so the first step is to create a blank container which represents the virtual machine configuration, and then we are going to install an operating system inside the container. To install an operating system inside that blank container, you must use the Virtual Machines console. The Virtual Machines console, available in the vSphere client, provides the mouse, keyboard, CD-DVD, and screen functionality. The Virtual Machine console allows access to the BIOS of the Virtual Machine and offers the ability to power on and off and to reset the Virtual Machine. Let's go ahead and create a Virtual Machine. To do that, we can right-click in a resource pool and select New Virtual Machine, or we can right-click on the ESXi server and select New Virtual Machine. I'm going to create the new virtual machine at the ESXi server level, so I'm going to right-click on the ESXi server. And here we can specify virtual machine configuration. We can do Typical. It says it creates a new virtual machine with the most common devices and configuration options. Or we can select Custom. Let's select Custom, just so we can go through it and see all of the options. I'm going to click Next. Here we can select the virtual machine name. The virtual machine's display name is used to name the files that make up the virtual machine itself. Therefore, avoid using special characters, including spaces, in the virtual machine's display name. Since the service console is Linux-based, File names with special characters or spaces can often cause problems, especially if you have to perform command line operations with these virtual machines. I'm going to call this Accounting Server 1, and usually I like this to coincide with the machine's name, but it doesn't have to, it can be longer and more descriptive. I'll click Next. Here we can select the resource pool within which you want to run this virtual machine. I can put it down in the test server's resource pool now, or I can put it at the top level resource pool, which would give it its normal attributes and access to all the parent's resources. Basically, it wouldn't be limited. Click Next. Here we can specify where we're going to put the actual files for the virtual machine. Except for the log files, the name of each file starts with the virtual machine's name. VM underscore name. Every virtual machine has a configuration file, Dot .vmx, one or more virtual disk files, first virtual disk has files vm underscore name dot vmdk, and vm underscore name dash flat dot vmdk, a file containing the virtual machine's BIOS, dot nvram, a log file, dot log, a swap file, dot vswp, and a snapshot description file, dot vmsd. This file is empty if the virtual machine has no snapshots. A virtual machine may have additional files if one or more snapshots have been taken or if raw disk mappings have been added. These are discussed further in the next movies. Now, if we add more storage on this system, which we do, we could choose the location of the virtual machine. But since we're going to take a look at adding additional storage to our ESXi server in a later movie, I will use local storage for now. I'm going to put it in on the only local storage available, and notice there's enough free space. Click Next. Now that we have vSphere 5, the standard for virtual machine hardware is version 8. We have the choice between version 4, 7, and 8. But what is the difference between the three? There are a number of enhancements in virtual machine hardware version 7 and in 8. The latest version 8 provides support for up to 32 vCPUs per virtual machine, maximum of one terabyte memory per virtual machine and better performance, non-hardware accelerated 3D graphics for Windows Aero support, so 32-way virtual SMP. That's pretty cool. It is also possible to assign any integer number of virtual CPUs between 1 and 32 to a virtual machine, but beware that not all operating systems support 32-way SMP. There is a new USB 3.0 device support in virtual machines with Linux guest operating systems which, for a long period of time, was only present in VMware Workstation. USB controllers finally made it to the ESXi server. USB 3.0 devices attached to the client computer running the vSphere web client 
or the vSphere client can be connected to a virtual machine and accessed within it. Don't be super excited though. USB devices connected to the ESXi host won't work. UEFI Virtual BIOS virtual machines running on ESXi 5 can boot from and use the unified extended firmware interface. Virtual machines with hardware version 8 can only run on ESXi 5 or higher, and if you have any ESX4.x hosts in your environment, you cannot vMotion between ESX4 and ESXi 5. Hardware version 8 virtual machines cannot power on ESX4 hosts. It's better to avoid using mixed mode, ESX4 and ESXi5, and instead have the entire environment run either version 4 or 5. What else? The new virtual hardware in ESXi has some cool new features like Virtual Machine Hot Plug Support, provides support for adding and removing virtual devices like virtual CPUs, and memory to a virtual machine without having to power off the virtual machine. VMX Net 3 is the third generation para virtualized NIC from VMware. New features include MSI and MSIX support, subject to guest operating system kernel support, receive side scaling, supported in Windows 2008 when explicitly enabled through the device's advanced configuration tab, IPVX checksum and TCP segmentation offloading, TSO, over IPv6, VLAN offloading, large TXRX ring size configured from within the virtual machine. We also have access to new storage virtual devices. Serial attached SCSI, SAS, virtual device from Microsoft Cluster Service, provides support for running Windows Server 2008 in a Microsoft Cluster Service configuration. IDE virtual device, ideal for supporting older operating systems that lack SCSI drivers. Okay, let's get back to creating our virtual machine. Here at the Guest Operating System screen, we can select which type of guest operating system we'd like to use. Notice we have a list of available operating systems, Microsoft, Linux, Apple OS X, Novell, Solaris, BSD, and others. And mine's going to be Microsoft Windows. And from the drop-down menu, I'm going to select version Microsoft Windows 2008 and I'll click Next. Number of virtual sockets. This is the number of processors that will appear on the virtual machine. If we want multiple, we can have multiple. And you might notice we can bring this up to four. And even though we don't actually have four physical processors on this machine, we have two. But we can specify four if we'd like. This is because each processor has two cores. If you have purchased enterprise license, you may take advantage of the multiple processors. Many guest OS application combinations are not enhanced by the additional CPU. Number of cores per virtual socket. If we select two virtual sockets up here and two cores per virtual socket, the total number of cores presented to the virtual machine would be four. So, what we can do here is manually assign the number of sockets that we want to assign to the virtual machine. Bear in mind that some operating systems are limited to run on a fixed number of CPUs. For example, Windows Server 2003 standard is limited to run on up to four CPUs. Although with this option here, we can assign eight core CPU to our virtual machine, and the virtual machine operating system sees eight single core CPUs. The operating system is still limited to four CPUs because Windows 2003 standard only runs on four vCPUs. Remember that one vCPU maps onto a physical core, not a physical CPU so the virtual machine is actually getting to run on four cores. Two, four, or more vCPU virtual machines should be created only in the comparatively infrequent instances where they are of benefit, not as a standard configuration. In a later module, we will discuss the relationship between virtual machines' number of virtual CPUs and the physical processors on the computer that host it. I'm going to select one. Click Next. Memory for this virtual machine. I'm going to go ahead and Let's give it, let me select it here. I'm going to give it two gigabytes. Click Next. Although the vSphere client interface may provide a default memory size for your virtual machine at the time of creation, make sure you research the memory needs of your applications and OS and size accordingly. The maximum memory size allowed for any virtual machine is one terabyte. Memory size is the maximum amount of memory that the virtual machine will see. 
the default recommended for this operating system is one gigabyte and maximum recommended for best performance, 32 gigabytes of RAM. NICs. How many NICs do we want to connect? We can do one, two, three, or four. I'm going to select one and we'll look at creating networks later, but notice I have four different networks. The one that I use for regular network traffic is VM underscore network. And we want to connect at power on. This is important to have it checked, otherwise, when your machine powers on, the network won't be available. So I'll click Next. SCSI adapter. Adding the first virtual disk implicitly adds a virtual SCSI adapter for it to be connected to. We can use Bus Logic, LSI Logic Parallel, or SAS, or VMware Paravirtual. The wizard automatically selects the type of virtual SCSI adapter based on the choice of guest operating system. So if you decide to change the type of operating system later on, make sure you go back to disk configuration and select a controller that is comparable with your operating system. I'm going to go ahead and keep it on LSI Logic Parallel. Click Next. Virtual Disk. We can use an existing virtual disk if we'd like. Let's say we've got a virtual hard disk, VMDK file, from another virtual machine, and we want to move it over and just attach it to this virtual machine. We can do that if we'd like, or we can just create a new one. There's also the new option to use raw device mapping, and the last one allows you to skip the step and leave the virtual machine with no disk. I'm going to select create a new virtual disk, and I'll click next. Disk size. Let's specify it at 40 gigabytes. We have this great feature here under disk provisioning where we can specify how do we want to provision the virtual disk. We can choose to either thin provision the disk or thick provision. If you select thin provision, you will only be using the disk space you need and VMware will allocate and commit space as needed. Traditionally, with virtual machines, if you create a 500 gigabyte virtual disk, it will use 500 gigabytes of your VMFS data store. With thin provisioning, you can create a 500 gigabyte virtual disk, but if only 100 gigabytes is in use, only 100 gigabytes of your VMFS data store will be utilized. If you don't choose thin provisioning, in here, ESXi server virtual disk will be monolithic and pre-extended. In other words, if you make a 40 gigabyte virtual disk, the result will be a single VMDK file of size 40 gigabytes. Location. Store within the virtual machine or specify the data store for this disk. I'll go ahead and select a VMFS to hold the new blank virtual disk. That is the shared storage 12 or shared storage 12 San LUN. Or I can store it with the virtual machine. Click next. Here we can specify the advanced options for this virtual disk we can specify the SCSI ID or IDE ID. You may cite the disk at a specific virtual SCSI target ID, for example, SCSI01, if you wish. This is very useful if your operating system expects to see particular SCSI or IDE ID. Finally, choose the appropriate disk mode. You can change the disk mode anytime the virtual machine is powered off. If you choose mode independent, says independent disks are not affected by snapshots and we'll go over snapshots in a later section. There are two options for independent disks, either persistent or non-persistent. Independent mode is very useful for testing virtual machines because if you select non-persistent, changes to the disk are discarded when you power off your virtual machine. This way, every time you power on the virtual machine, you have a clean slate operating system. I'm not going to use any of these two modes and I'll just click next. And here's a nice summary of what we've done. We've named it Accounting Server 1, folder LAB, and host or cluster name is here. It's in a cluster, that's why we've seen the name of the cluster here. Specific host. It's the name of the ESXi server where the virtual machine will be placed. Data store. Here's our storage. Guest operating system, and so on and so forth. I'll click Finish. And here's our first virtual server. So this virtual machine is basically a blank server. I mean, it's got processor, hard drive, it's connected to the network, it's got everything. It's just as if it was shipped to you from the manufacturer and it doesn't have an operating system on it. Next, we're going to look at putting an operating system on this virtual server. Did you know that after watching our videos, you can sign up for a week of remote access to our VMware lab? It's custom built and allows you to actually practice on enterprise grade VMware servers and storage. VIAdmin.com 
provides a remote server environment or VMware practice lab composed of vSphere ready lab servers for class or individual use. You can sign up at www.viadmin.com for access to the lab. You get one dedicated server with lots of memory, plenty of network cards, co-training servers in a cluster, two shared SANLANs, management station, and a KVM controller to manage your server. Within the VMware lab, you can set up any scenario including multipathing, high availability, vMotion, fault tolerance, DRS, create 10, 15, or more virtual machines, and test all of the VMware advanced features. One more thing, we have an instructor-led vSphere training consisting of live mentoring, e-labs, and e-lectures all delivered online. The training offers the professional a specialized tutoring platform that isn't available elsewhere and includes a schedule that matches your particular needs, live one-to-one -one tuition with an instructor, various labs, and Q&A sessions, and the chance to master VMware virtual infrastructure on a real-life teaching environment. Our VMware virtual mentoring goes far beyond mere video teaching. With access to a live tutor, you'll be helped through the different labs and you'll have an opportunity to ask questions and learn even more. So if you're really looking to gain hands-on VMware experience, you've come to the right place. Sign up for VMware Lab, Self-Managed Access, or join one of our instructor-led trainings today. Thanks for watching. Oh, I forgot to mention, we have a special YouTube subscribers bonus. When you sign up for access to our VMware Lab, Send us your YouTube username and we'll give you an in-depth, easy to follow, step-by-step -step lab book with lots of exercises and over 200 pages of top quality training for free.